a little, you know, somewhat steady at this point. So I think we can, we can go ahead and, uh, and get started, everybody. I'm sure there will be more people joining us. I can see a few more, but uh, I don't want to make people wait too long. So um, I want to say good evening. Thank you uh, all for joining us uh, for this webinar uh, tonight. I am uh, Henrik Schatzinger, and I'm the co-director of the Center for Politics and the People at uh, Ripon College, along with my colleague here on the screen, uh, Brian Smith. Uh, I'm Professor Emeritus uh, of, of Religion. And uh, tonight's event is sponsored by the CPP, as well as the Ripon College chapter of uh, Pi Sigma Alpha, the uh, only national political science honor society. The title of our, of our webinar, um, After the Election, What Now?, tells us what you can expect from our discussion tonight. A closer look at what led to the election outcome in Wisconsin and nationally, but also we want to take a look ahead. Uh, what are the implications and challenges ahead uh, with regard to policy making, our political parties, but also polarization and the political discourse in our society. Uh, it is my great honor to introduce uh, our distinguished panelists tonight. And I'll start with, uh, with Molly Beck. Uh, Molly Beck uh, is the state government and politics reporter for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Uh, formerly, she was a journalist uh, for the Wisconsin State Journal, the State Journal Register, and the Overtana Pe People's Press. So thank you, uh, Molly, for joining us tonight. We also have uh, with us uh, Annalise Eicher, and she is the chair of the Dane County uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, located in Madison, uh, Wisconsin. She was the um, executive director of One Wisconsin Now, an issue advocacy organization that uh, is the leading progressive voice uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, she's also the vice chair of the Emerge Wisconsin Board of uh, Directors, uh, whose mission it is to increase the number of democratic women leaders from diverse backgrounds in public office. Um, Annalise, uh, you also have uh, a disclaimer. Uh, could you share it uh, briefly with us? Yes, thank you, Henrik, and thank you for having me this evening. Um, I do just want to let folks know that I am not here in my official capacity uh, as the chair of the County Board of Dane County. Um, I promised my attorneys I would say that, so not here in my official capacity. Okay, well, thanks for making that clear, Annalise. And then we also have Charlie Sykes with us, uh, who has been joining us for, for other events, uh, well, formerly on campus, now in the form of webinar, and so we're really grateful that he's here uh, with us tonight. He is a political commentator uh, who is also editor-in-chief uh, of the website The Bulwark. Uh, I certainly recommend that you uh, check it out uh, if you haven't done so and uh, do so frequently. Uh, for many years, he was one of the state's top-rated and most influential talk show hosts uh, with a daily show on WTMJ radio based in Milwaukee. And he is the author of many books and also an MSNBC contributor. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have received many questions uh, from our um, uh, um, attendees tonight. In fact, uh, over 40 questions. So thank you very much for taking the time to uh, <laughs> To, you know, to submit them and to really think about what you would, what you'd like to hear talk about, uh, us, uh, talk about. So we have then categorized these questions into four themes to kind of make it more manageable. And so those, the first theme is really about Wisconsin, the Wisconsin electorate, um, the urban rural divide that we see not only in Wisconsin, but also nationally, and just the implications of the elections for Wisconsin politics. Second, people are interested in hearing more about the two-party system um, and the challenges, uh, frankly, for both parties uh, ahead. What, are, what do you see as sort of um, lessons the parties should take away from this election outcome? And you know, what, are some, what are some issues associated with that? And third, we have the prospects for the incoming US Congress and the new president's um, agenda. Uh, and so we want to talk a little bit about nationally, what can we expect going ahead under divided government, which is uh, a more likely outcome, um, or even under unified government, depending on the Senate races in Georgia. And then lastly, people are really interested in like, 
to be honest, understanding each other better, right? Uh, and in terms of understanding the polarization and, and, and what can be done to heal some of the sort of divisions in our society. So we had, had quite a few questions uh, surrounding that. Uh, I will handle the first two themes and then my colleague Brian Smith uh, will, will step in and he will focus on the questions surrounding you know, upcoming agendas and the polarization issue. So um, this first segment, again, for each theme, we'll think about roughly 10 minutes or so. After that, we'll have about uh, 30 minutes for questions from you that come up during our conversation. So please use the Q&A. You may wanna use the chat. We will monitor both to see sort of how we can accommodate sort of some of the incoming incoming questions. So feel free to use them. We will, we will uh, look at them as we go. So let's jump right into it uh, and look at really Wisconsin first. Uh, when you think about it, you know, some people have asked very directly, what can be learned from this election about the Wisconsin electorate? But so in other words, sort of, and also what is your biggest takeaway from the election that Wisconsinites should know? And maybe more specifically, if we're looking at the election results, they are, you know, in some way similar trends around the country, right? We see this sort of rural-urban divide. If we just kind of compare 2016 to 2020, we can see sort of red sort of rural areas becoming redder, sort of blue urban areas becoming bluer. Um, does, this, does this concern you? And what are the implications of that? Um, for for the parties. I just saw today an interesting infographic in the, in the New York Times talking about areas in the rural areas where automation of jobs is going to uh, be likely and, uh, and, and, and increased. Uh, and those are areas where, where um, the Republican Party is really strong and Democrats are struggling. And so I'm wondering, you know, why is that, uh, for example, right? So I kind of, I, I want to basically allow you to pick one of the things we just mentioned about the biggest takeaway or that you see for Wisconsin. Um, and you, and we can, you know, on my screen, we have Molly first. Uh, do you, do you want to, do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, again, thanks for, thanks for having us. I'm excited to, to talk about all this tonight. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from this election is, is maybe not a surprising one for Wisconsin. You know, we are really divided. We're evenly split. We feel really strongly about politics. Um, every vote here truly matters. Uh, 2020 was not the reshaping of the electorate that 2016 was. Uh, President Trump preserved his gains and then sometimes built upon them in some areas of the state. And um, you know, so-called Trump country did not, you know, swing swing back to Democrats and the counties that voted for President Obama and then for President Trump, they, they didn't swing either. So, um, and, it, and the president-elect also preserved, you know, Hillary Clinton's performance uh, in 2016 and, and, and built upon those too. We saw, you know, just a voting powerhouse of Dane County, um, Milwaukee County, Milwaukee's turnout was, was pretty flat, but the suburbs around Milwaukee, um, those, there were some shifts there in, in Biden's favor. And so I think, you know, that's the takeaway for me for Wisconsin that, you know, what happened in 2016, um, a lot of that happened again in, in 2020. Um, I'd say nationally that, you know, both sides were hoping voters would would give them a total mandate, and I don't think that happened in, in this in this case because it, it doesn't appear that the Democrats are on track to win the Senate, um, and Republicans in the state legislature didn't get the veto-proof majority. So it's you know it's just a a, a split outcome. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Thank you, uh, Molly, for your initial thoughts on this. Uh, uh, Annalise, you're kind of in, in the trenches sort of uh, of Wisconsin politics. Uh, you know, yours is more from the sort of the urban kind of perspective, but uh, still I'm interested in the same, you know, hearing more from you in terms of what do you see as the, um, the biggest takeaway from this election? 
Uh, well, again, thanks for having me this evening. But, um, you know, I think the, the biggest takeaway and is one, again, that we're not, it's not new, it's not something that we're surprised about is that, you know, we're, we're a purple state. I mean, you have in this, the last four years, Trump, Biden, Clinton, Johnson, Baldwin, Evers, Walker, all competing for those same um, sets of, of, of voters. And we've seen, um, as Molly indicated, um, uh, some, some shifts and some trends. Um, I think that that is you know, consistent with where our population is growing, Dane County, one of the fastest growing areas of the state. Um, but, you know, look, particularly looking at the, the suburbs around Milwaukee, I was actually surprised that more of those suburbs didn't trend more towards the Democrats, given um, the messaging uh, and, and the candidates this time around. Um, I ex honestly, I, I had, you know, hoped that a couple more of those seats would have flipped. Um, but I think that that is a trend that's going to, you know, continue and is a pretty good indicator um, I think the the other piece about this, uh, you know, in addition to our state being purple, is that you continue to see, uh, eight, ten years later, the impacts of gerrymandering um, on, on Wisconsin. And so we have these places where our populations have shifted um, that, you know, continue to turn out, um, you know, for Democrats at the top of the ticket. Uh, but then the vote share is split uh, at, at the at the assembly and the Senate level that uh, turns those seats to um, to to Republicans. And so I think um, the the you know th this has essentially been the theme of the last number of elections is we're purple, we're gerrymandered. Um, and you know the other piece of this, I think is, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the urban and rural divide, and I don't know that I would characterize it as much as urban and rural as an age and opportunity gap. Um, you know, if we're looking at, you know, the ages of folks uh, in our rural versus our urban areas, if we're looking at the economic opportunities in our urban versus our rural areas, um, this is, you know, I, I think those are the stronger indicators uh, as to what's making up, you know, that, that vote difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And I would like to hear a little bit more as we go on and about this opportunity gap. And especially, it seems like this, these are often like, you know, Trump and Republican strongholds, sort of, you know, what, a, what can maybe Democrats do? In fact, let me ask you right now, what do you think, you know, <laughs> Democrats really can do to maybe, um, you know, help narrow that opportunity gap and also getting the message across, right? Uh, again, Democrats are doing really well in with the sort of younger, maybe educated or your higher income voters and so on. But what about um, sort of the message to rural America? Well, you know, I think it has to start at the local level. Um, you know, those are the issues that we, you know, almost you know, despite having differences on, you know, state and federal issues, there's a lot of things that we do agree on on the local level. And that's, you know, where you tend to find that common ground. And I think, um, you know, if inroads are going to be made, um, you know, by the Democrats, by progressives in those more, you know, Trump entrenched, as you said, uh, you know, rural areas, um, you know, it, it has to start locally. Um, and I, you know, I think it, it, it's interesting though as well because there are Democrats in rural areas, um, but you see the, again, coming back to gerrymandering that, you know, those, you know, places and the districts are drawn in a way um, that we don't see that being able to be reflected. I mean, we used to have, um, more rural Democrats. We used to have more, you know, urban Republicans, and you know the the, the division and the the partisan gerrymandering has really taken that from us. Okay. Well, <clears throat> so these are some good comments, and like allow for some good follow up questions. But I want to get Charlie in here as well. Um, Charlie, could you sort of share your thoughts on the election and its outcome, kind of in a nutshell, for us? Yeah, I'm going to follow up with uh, some of the things that Molly s said, because I, I agree with all of that. I mean, when we talk about how divided Wisconsin is, I actually want to throw out the, the question of whether we actually are purple or whether we are just a bright, you know, 
blue, and red, because there is that line. Um, Molly's colleague, Craig Gilbert, had a really interesting fact, uh, factoid he put out today, that since 2000, we have had four presidential elections decided by less than 1%. No other, only a handful of other states. So it would be 2000, 2004, 2016, 2020. A uh, handful of states uh, have had two elections that were that close. Most states, uh, none. So you know, when we talk about how closely divided we are, um, th I mean, that's, it, is, it is really quite an extraordinary thing. And there is a real divide between urban and, and rural. It, it's, um, it, it may be uh, metropolitan areas versus small towns in a lot of ways. Um, I, I had three things that really struck me about the election. Uh, number one was the incredible powerhouse that Dane County has become for Democrats. Handley, you should have spiked football on that one. <laughs> because the turnout of votes there was so extraordinary. Uh, clearly, Biden would not have won the state um if the turnout had been the same and and this happened four years ago uh dane county turned out in big numbers for hillary clinton when milwaukee was disappointing this year milwaukee was, was flat but dane county came up with this amazing number of new votes so that that is that's one of the main storylines the second storyline is the national erosion of support on the suburbs i'm sitting here in mequon wisconsin a little community to the north of me is cedarburg there was a period this summer where every reporter in America came to Cedarburg to write a report about what was going on because Cedarburg was the quintessential American city and they found all kinds of Trumpists and QAnon supporters on, on the main street. As far as I can tell, Joe Biden won Cedarburg, which is extraordinary. So you are seeing the Milwaukee suburbs becoming much, much softer. But rural Wisconsin, these small towns, they have become more Trumpy. And I think that that's also going to be, you know, going forward, the fact that if Joe Biden couldn't break into that, it's going to be really tough, I think, for Democrats to do this. So you had the Trumpier sections of Wisconsin become Trumpier. You had the more Democratic strongholds like Dane County become much more intense. And then you had the erosion in the suburbs. So I think all those stories, you know, are, are, are parallel to one another. But, and I know we're gonna to get to, to the divides here. Um, I still think it, it, it's extraordinary for me to see how a state where the Republican Party was so skeptical of Donald Trump four years ago, how completely Trumpified it has become. And, you know, Annalise was saying she was surprised that more things hadn't switched in, in the start. I think you were talking about legislative seats. But, um, you, you know, what we have seen is in a very short period of time, the tribalization of politics along Trumpian lines. Look, I mean, this was, we, we've all been around a long time. We know how polarized things were going back into the Walker years. That's not new. But to see it transferred over into to Trump has been, has been rather extraordinary. So when we say that we're divided, I do think that it's, it, it's, it's worthwhile not getting caught up in making that a cliche because there's really almost no state in America that is as closely divided as Wisconsin over a long period of time. And this line really, when you look at the maps, you really do see how stark the divisions are between one part of the state and the other. And obviously that's here to stay. That's not going away. Yeah, thank you uh, for those uh, remarks, Charlie. Um, I want to kind of follow up by a question from one of the attendees. Uh, and to be honest, there were like two or three that were kind of similar. Uh, they were really interested in like the prospects of re reapportionment and, and gerrymandering continuing sort of after this, uh, after this election, you know, this, those. Can I, can I respond to something that Charlie yes. said really quickly Absolutely. before we get into the reapportionment? Um, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's interesting in that, you know, he and I are, agree on the suburbs, um, but I, I am not at all surprised um, that, you know, that, that folks became so entrenched. Um, you know, we have, in, have had in Wisconsin for years, um, a, you know, a, a, a right wing um, conglomerate of organizations and media and, 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 and talkers who have, um, 
they they created this environment that was i think a little bit under the surface for you know for a while and it was it wasn't as socially acceptable for folks to be engaging in you know this outward um you know, vitriol and hatred towards others that we've seen played out in not only Trump's behavior, but the behavior of his supporters. But I think that there was, you know, that we have to talk about how that contributed to the division in Wisconsin and the polarization in Wisconsin, um, you know, when we're, we're talking about how we got to this point, because there was this, um, this, this, this beast that existed that sought to stoke those thoughts and those fears. Um, and, and I don't think that we can ignore that and we should not be surprised that, you know, not, you know, that Trump won Wisconsin in 16 after, um, you know, what happened, but then that we were, that, that the Trump area stayed Trump and became, as, as Charlie said, Trumpier um, this time around. And so I, I just, I don't want to have that point lost as to how did we get here? Because I think that is going to be key and to be part of where do we go from here and what is next and how do we overcome some of this, um, if that's even possible. Uh, you know, I, I, I've said for a while that I think, you know, Wisconsin is, uh, you know, often this this ground zero of, um, you know, any number of things that are happening in the rest of the country. Um, and so, it, you know, if, if we can potentially figure out, uh, you know, how to how to make that work, you know, does that have ramifications for the rest of the country? And, you know, I think it's particularly interesting, you know, particularly in the case of, Car in the case of Charlie, in that, you know, you and, and a number of others were that sort of, you know, that never Trump, Trump's last stand in, in 16, like, you know, this is not someone we want leading the Republican Party. And yet, you know, that is lost. And where does that, where does that go then? And, and what does that mean for, for the parties, which I know is, is part of the other question, but I, I, I think that needs to be part of our discussion. One of the uh, attendees just um, put a comment, I think it's, it, it pertains to what we said about tribalism. And they said that it, the, the word tribalism doesn't describe so some of the divisions are within families. You know, and we have the holidays coming up and, you, and it's based on uh, education. But so the divisions, I, 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 we have to be careful with the categories we use and where the, where the fault lines are, because they go right down to the household. So any of you want to comment on that? Um, no, I think it's a legitimate point, but I do think that tribalization is 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 a good term because I think it it's an analogy to the way in which people choose sides, red versus blue. But it, there's no question about it; it divide it divides households. And and by the way, I, we, we we I know we'll come back to Annalise's comments a little bit later because I agree in part and I dissent in part about about all of that. Uh, obviously, I have some experience in all of that, uh, as does her previous organization. Um, but I do think that this is one of the things that we have to, to cope with, is the degree to which our politics has become so polarized. I mean, there was a time when I think everybody in this group might have thought that politics, or maybe not, maybe, maybe I was the naive one, thought that politics was about ideas, it was about policies, um, when in fact it really was more about identity, it was about posturing, and I think that we live in a world in which people's uh, political views are so tied up with their identity and they can create or they can go into an alternative reality uh, that makes it very difficult to communicate across those lines. Once you're in one of these alternative reality silos, it's extremely difficult to break into that or to cross over and to have the kind of dialogue. And you can see this in a map of Wisconsin. I mean, we can see this polarization in Wisconsin. And then it's also replicated in social media. What do you, which cable station do you watch? What, what are you getting on your Facebook feed? So we, we do live in a very different reality from one another and we pick and choose those things. And so I think the tribalization is not to put a racial connotation on it. It's to say that we've picked which team we are on and we find the, the data and the arguments that support our team. And I mean, this, this, is, this is one of the things that, 
you know, after 2016, when I was trying to figure out what was going on, I actually had to read a lot of stuff by social psychologists. I'm sorry to go on so long here. Where, because I, I think a lot of us think that we use our minds to determine whether something is true or not true. In fact, the way we're wired is to use our minds to in, you know, enhance our bond to our tribe. So if something is inconvenient, we don't want to believe it. We just need one piece of data to basically you know, get us back in good with, with, with the tribe. And, and the, the reverse is true as well. So I'm sorry, that was a longer answer. But you know, whether you want to talk about tribalization, whether you want to talk about polarization, I mean, this is the dynamic that we face. And of course, you can see it so starkly here in Wisconsin. I, I have something just to add to that quickly. I, and I don't mean to self-promote, but I, I do think the decline of newspapers is a factor in all of this. I think it's, you know, people are not getting, uh, you know, one news source of facts delivered to their doorstep. And, you know, for a long time, there wasn't 24 hours of cable news that has a lot of punditry that, you know, you can turn it on and just, you can create an echo chamber for yourself. And, and I think at, at one point when it was, you know, you got your news from newspapers and there was one set of facts more or less for people, you know, that has changed with social media and the decline of newspapers, small communities, some, some don't even have a newspaper anymore. So the, the politics they're consuming is, is mostly national and that's, you know, a lot more divided than local politics. And, and, I, and I know it's not everything, but I do think that that is a factor in all of this that, you know, there, there's, everybody has their own set of facts now and it, it didn't used to be like that, like it is now, you know, before. Yeah, absolutely. The, we see the nationalization of the of the news news consumption here. Um, I want to. Our second theme is sort of the party theme, right? And you know, somebody was asking here, uh, Skip Whitler, is sort of what positions and you know part of the platform and characteristics of the Republican Party is so appealing to more rural quote unquote voters. What what would you say? And sort of again, it goes back to the challenges for Democrats. Sort of how how can they um, become maybe more appealing? Is that for me? Sorry. <laughs> or any, anybody. <laughs> um, well, I, uh, I would say that the, the parties right now are, are mere images of each other in terms of strength and, strengths and, weak, and weaknesses. Democrats are really strong in the cities and gathering strength in the suburbs and are not as competitive in rural areas right now. And, and Republicans are the opposite. You know, they're they're not in the cities. They are slipping in the suburbs, but still have some strength and, and dominate in the rural areas. So I think that the challenges for both parties going forward are, you know, how to get you know voters that in the last couple of cycles just haven't voted for them. With the Republican Party, it's you know that they're facing some challenges with college-educated voters, especially women in the suburbs, and and you know it it's it will be. Well, it'll be interesting to see if that's all tied to the president. Um, I know that that's been labeled as a big factor, but that's what I'll be watching for if that continues to be a trend, if he is not president, you know, um, challenges for Democrats are rural voters who, you know, many of them who are not college educated and have been voting for, for President Trump. So I, I think going forward, those are, you know, it's kind of the same problem in a different way for both. Mm -hmm seems to me that sort of grassroots organizations, you know, are really, or organizing is stronger on the Republican side. I don't know if Democrats, how they can maybe reach out, maybe Annalise has some ideas, how to, they can reach out better into those, those areas where Democrats are struggling. Um, yeah, I don't know that they would, that I would say that they're not, that the Democrats aren't organizing in those areas, but um, it, it's, for 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 a lot of folks, the agreement is on, you know, with with one party is is just on on, on one issue. And so, like, for example, if you agree with the um, Democrats on on water issue or land use issues, um, but you have a just this entrenched view of you know something else that you absolutely cannot get over. Um, that you know the Democrat is supporting, then you know you're you're going to continue to vote for that, you know that that Republican. I think you know the other thing that um, continues to to come up, and I, I think is um, 
key for almost all voters is is economics and who you see as the you know the the better one for your personal economics and for you know a lot of folks in the you know the rural areas who you know might be um you know farming on a more commercial scale or um you know listening to 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 rhetoric that you know isn't necessarily um ringing true um you know like all those manufacturing jobs that were supposed to come back uh that didn't um you know that they you hold on to to that um you know i think the other piece of this is, is change is hard it's it's hard to change your mind uh as as an individual I and mean, it's hard to let go of um you know principles and and values and and things that you were you know either raised with or within your community and to go against um other folks in in your area it it's hard uh it is it is hard to be a liberal in a you know republican you know conservative rural area um you know the same is that i've i've heard from you know republicans who are in urban areas or you know the suburbs you know even even mixed and so uh it 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 takes a lot uh, uh it takes a toll on the on an individual in order to break from that that mold and you know i think that we've seen particularly in the last four years is more folks come out and say mm, i'm really not comfortable with with trump and his ideas and what is now the republican party um you know as it's trump's republican party and so, you know, but they're also not, they're not Democrats. And so what does, you know, where, where are they aligning and how, where are they finding common ground? And I think we're seeing a lot more of that, you know, happening um, in issue-based, um, you know, online communities, issue-based, uh, you know, like, commu like physical in, in community. It's hard to think about that because we've all been um, <laughs> in our homes for months now. Um, but you know that 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 piece of it that that uniting on issues is so much easier than it is to you know tie oneself with um, you know one party or the other. Mm -hmm. I just want to interject. No, well, uh, can I can I actually answer the question though? I mean, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Charlie. I, I, I think a lot of this is dancing around the fact that uh, rural Wisconsin has changed dramatically. Um, I, I remember one of my earliest uh, campaigns was working for David Obi, who was a congressman from Northwest Wisconsin, and he won overwhelmingly. The, you know, Northern was rural Wisconsin was very heavily Democratic, and it's not anymore. So what's driving all of this? Well, part of this has been the change in the political parties. And I think that we have to understand the role of negative partisanship. Uh, I used to get a lot of calls from people saying, well, you know, how are Trump's uh, uh, tariffs affecting the rural vote? And I said, they're not, because um, it's more about culture and it's about identity than it is about economics. Uh, you also need to understand, I think, the role of contempt and respect. You go into rural areas, you talk to the voters, and they, they, they may not be total Trump fans and everything, but what they do feel is they feel that the political establishment, the media, and the left see, thinks of them with contempt. They don't feel respected. And this is a theme that people like Trump and the Republicans have exploited, that they're not attacking me, they're attacking you. They look down on you. It's not about guns, it's about the people who have guns. Uh, the role of religion cannot be overstated. You go into a lot of these communities, and whatever the other issues are, if there's a sense that Democrats do not respect religious freedom, in a sense, I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm reporting on this because I mean, some of this is like, you, you, get, you get fed back. And also look, if, you, if, if the image of a political party is one of looking down on certain kinds of Americans, you will get this reaction. And that's one of the things you've seen in all of this. And it doesn't have to happen, but I do think, and I spend most of my time talking about the, the right wing bubble, and the right-wing alternative uh, media, but there's also, you know, a progressive bubble as well, where sometimes I don't think they realize how they come off and the and the contempt that they throw off. So, you know, for example, racial issues are incredibly complex in Wisconsin, but it is not helpful to constantly 
call everyone you disagree with a racist. There are real racial problems. We saw this played out in this campaign. But there's two different approaches. One is to say, you people are bigots and that you need to prove that you are not supporting white supremacy versus saying, look, we, you don't want to associate yourself with this kind of conduct. You don't want to associate yourself with the kind of racism from the president, the dog whistles, uh, you know, the, 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 the xenophobia. I do think that there's two ways you do it. You, you appeal to the better angel of people's nature, or you basically say those people with their guns and their white supremacy and everything. And politically what happens is I think people shut off and they stop listening. And I think that's been one of the tragedies that we have here. So one of the strongest things that I saw from the Biden campaign is he didn't do that. Joe Biden actually did not do the things I'm talking about, which is why I thought he was going to make a little bit more, more progress. And maybe that will take time because these things do, you know, it doesn't, a political campaign is a very difficult time to change a culture. It doesn't always happen. But I do think that if Joe Biden and the Democrats continue that sort of look, we are all Americans. We have a shared story. Let's respect one another. Let's not demonize one another. It might actually pay off. I know that we're going to get to the division a little bit later, but I think in rural Wisconsin, part of this, you can't, you can't really understand the vote without negative partisanship and that sense of uh, that they are looked down upon uh, with contempt and they want to be respected. And, and for a lot of them, voting for Donald Trump is kind of a middle finger aimed at that media, um, you know, Hollywood establishment that they think despises them. And I think you have to think about that in both ways, though, as well, because, you know, we, you, you see the, you know, it, it, it's the same reaction and that, that same feeling of attack and, and contempt on, um, you know, folks who are, and assumptions made on folks who are, you know, in our more urban areas or who, you know, are, you know, black and have different life experiences. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it, it's not just, just one side of the other. And I, I do think it's, um, you know, I, I agree that, you know, the Biden campaign and, and, and Joe himself, and I think that speaks to his character, um, you know, really is, you know, he, he didn't do that. I mean, he approaches almost every single individual with, with respect and, you know, with that message, it's like, yep, we're all, we're all this the same. I'm going to be every single one of us is you know president. Um, but when you also have the candidate on the other side of that who is you know carrying the Republican Party flag, who is taking a completely opposite approach, and yet, you know we we I would have loved to have seen a landslide and a complete you know <laughs> refutation of Trump. Uh, that didn't happen, no. and that I think you know, is, as you said, a middle finger for some, but, you know, for others, it is a, you know, sure, Biden has won this election, but half the people in this country do not value me as a human being. And that is going to continue it. to I, cause problems. I totally agree with that. Believe it or not, I actually do agree with that. I mean, and that's, um, uh, and, and, I, and I think that's, that is, that is concerning. But we'll, I know we're coming back to this later. Let me make a suggestion. We're, we're really uh, very rich conversation, but we're not going to get to that theme of polarization. Uh, we were not going to have time. Um, I'd like to suggest that maybe we, we go to that now. The third question had to do with um, uh, uh, what we think is going to happen with the new Congress, um, the president's agenda, and so forth. And maybe we could hold that for a minute because this polarization theme is very serious. Um, let me um, recount the results of a Pew uh, Research um, survey that was done just before the election and it was published on November 6th. And what it found was that nine in 10 Democrats and nine in 10 Republicans believe that if the other side wins the election, there's going to be lasting damage to the country. Also, four of five Republicans and over three quarters of Democrats feel that the other side does not share core American values with them. It's not just that they disagree on policy, but the deep core values the other side does not share. That is serious. 
the hopeful uh, statistic from that survey was that nine out of 10, both Democrats and Republicans, want their candidate, if he wins, to be concerned about the needs of all Americans, not just their side. That's the kernel of hope, that there is a hope that people have, but on the other side, there are deeply ingrained convictions that the other side is not trustworthy. Now, what, what do we do with that? How, how do we go forward with this? Uh, how do we um, respect people? Uh, how do we appeal to their better angels? So what, what, where, where do we begin? I think Mo Molly has the answer to that. <laughs> Yeah, well, for sure. I I know I touched on this before, but I, I truly worry about the information people are consuming and how they're consuming it and how what that does when we ask these kinds of questions, like how people think of people who aren't like them or maybe aren't voting the same way they are. Um, you know, if, if you're in a community and you, you're not really um, reading about local politics or what local elected officials are doing who are Republicans and Democrats, you're just consuming that information at the national level, which is really bitterly divided and always, always has been. And you're not running into, you know, those people in the grocery store. Like you, may, you just, I don't, I think you lose the nuance of a person, <laughs> you know, if you just see the parties through the national lens. And I, and I truly think that that goes back to just not having you know, an unbiased source of information that you turn to and you rely on and it is a, per a permanent part of your life. You know, it, it, right now everybody's getting all sorts of information from all sorts of sources and who knows if, if it's real or if it's including the context that it needs to. And, you know, you can create your own world with that. And I'm not saying everybody does that, but, you know, th there's there's just not an agreed, agreed upon set of facts and there's not um, as much local journalism anymore. And so people just aren't seen um, in the same ways, aren't seeing local elected officials in those parties. And I, and I think, you know, I, I, again, that's not everything, but I do think that is, that is part of this. You know, we're, we don't, seeing, seeing some, a Democrat or a Republican as a person, you know, you're not yeah. seeing that person in, in real life, so, you know? So yeah, we, uh, Twitter is not real life. This is an important, important right. lesson here. And I remember that and I've talked to other people who had the same experience that if you spend too much time on Twitter or social media, which I do, and you go out into the actual world and meet real people, it's kind of startling um, because you find out they're like a lot nicer than you thought. They're a lot more open-minded. You can have a conversation with them. Um, early on in this, in this um, after the, the election, I was involved in something uh, called StoryCorps, where they would get people of differing political opinions and you'd have to be in the same room with them and actually talk about your life. And w w the one thing that my takeaway was, and this is to Molly's point, if you are forced to deal with someone as an actual human being, um, and perhaps not simply debate the top line or you're, you're for Trump or for Biden, you'll find out you have much more in common than you have that, 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 that separates you. The problem is, is that we don't have those kinds of conversations because everything has been nationalized. So we do deal with one another. Um, and, and the reality is, is that, you know, you, you open up Twitter feed and the people who disagree with you are going to use the, the, the most vitriolic possible language to describe you. And you know what, at a certain point, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to talk about your, your shared education values when the other person has basically, you know, called you, uh, you know, called you a variety of names. So, yeah, to, to, to that extent that we have to figure out a way to interact with one another as human beings, um, it, would, it makes a, a huge difference. And I will say the, the best thing that's happened to me in the last four years has been to be involved in organizations or efforts where there are people who I probably wouldn't have sat down with before and have conversations about what we agreed on and what we disagreed on, and do realize that there is this coalition of the decent, and it's center left, center right in my particular case, uh, to be able to have those conversations. And this was, this was quite a revelation, having spent the previous 20 years basically in a very, very partisan, polarized environment. Would you think that some of our non-politically uh, connected organizations 
in civil society, uh, our schools, our churches, our, our business clubs, our rotary clubs, do they have a role to play now to promote this kind of face-to-face -face conversation? Because it's gonna be very hard to do it through the parties. Uh, and Alexis de Tocqueville in 1830, when he came to this country, said that one of the things that he felt was very hopeful about our society was that we had institutions between the individual and the government and political parties that brought people together as citizens to do what Aristotle said politics is all about, to have civil dialogue about the good life. Do any of you see hope for any of those non-governmental institutions today to step forward and try to bring us together? I think that there is an opportunity, but um, we have to be willing to take the chance. Um, because of how polarized, um, you know, folks are, it is difficult for your, your optimists, your Rotarians to, um, you know, even broach the topic of politics. And, you know, we don't see the same kind of, not just, you know, social clubs, but we, we don't see the same kinds of robust discussions um, or, or exchanges of thought um, among different groups of people anymore, you know, like in golf leagues or bowling leagues or, you know, or, or things like that. We don't, we don't have these, um, the, these places where, you know, we all used to, to gather. Um, and I say we as a you know, woman in my early 30s that, that, you know, wasn't necessarily my reality. But, you know, in, in, in thinking about our history, I mean, as things have moved online, um, you know, we've, we've as, as Charlie said, and as, as Molly said, you know, we, we found those, those bubbles and we are limited um, in what we hear. And so I think if there is a willingness of, um, you know, our, our social organizations, but also a willingness within uh, ourselves as individuals to take a step back, um, to, you know, have that emotional in intelligence to, um, you know, put something on the back burner so that you can attempt to find a common ground. Um, but again, that's really, really hard. Um, it is hard to do um, when there are, um, you know, when, when there are folks who, as I said before, feel like there's there's no way to have a conversation with a person who doesn't see you as a person. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it comes back to me to willingness to, you know, essentially be be brave and, and to sort of have that. Um, because I think, you know, we all, there there is a set of, a set of like core shared American values, but that political polarization has, um, you know, entrenched us in, in different sides of it, where we all think that what we think is lining up with that value, um, and, you know, we're just refusing to find that, that common ground, and mm. it's hard. So one, one observation somebody made when I was, uh, I was on the Knight Commission uh, to restore faith in media and democracy, and we spent a couple of years on this. I don't know that we restored any faith at all, but we, we heard a lot of interesting testimony. And one, one of the things I thought was most interesting is the importance of the Thanksgiving dinner, which none of us are now going to have with our extended family because of the coronavirus. But the, the cost of rejecting people with whom we disagree. So on social media, if I don't like any, something you're saying, I just, you know, swipe left on you, right? I can, I, can, I, I, can, I can turn you off and the cost to me is nothing. I can, or I can insult you and the cost to me is nothing. I don't have to engage with you. When you're sitting at a social gathering, the cost of insulting someone to their face is much higher. Yeah, you know, your crazy bigoted uncle may say something, but if you, you know, throw the mashed potatoes at him and walk out of the house, there are consequences to you. So um, there's a, it is such a fundamental difference to have those face-to-face -face conversations as opposed to what we've gotten so used to of just basically eliminating anyone we don't like um, or, or flaming them. And, and so and I, I'm, I'm not sure whether social media exposes how awful we were all along. We didn't have a chance to express ourselves or whether it's made us worse. I think probably it's a little bit of both. 
I think it made it easier for us to show what was there all along. I, I think it, it also replaced some of those institutions that you're you're asking about. You know, I, I like, you know, the little class reunion, you know, my class doesn't have that because we're all on Facebook. You know, there's no need to do that. We know what everybody's kids looks like. So, um, you know, I, and I also, you know, things like the Lions Club or the, you know, the Eagles Club or all, all of those clubs, you know, I, I think younger people are just not joining those because they're getting the social interaction online, which is, which is not as productive, you know, obviously than, than talking to people in person and like understanding like, oh, hey, you know, both of our dads like went to the same high school. That's cool. You know, things like that. Like you just don't get that anymore. I think, you know, we're now, yeah, we, we're now kind of focusing again, which is interesting on families and churches and communities and so on. But I think it's really hard to make progress on the, on the front of, you know, being civil when you see the people at the top, right? People in Congress, senators and so on, uh, engaging in really sort of, you know, uncivil behavior and how they treat each other, right? So people, people, I think, still look up and see sort of what's happening at the top. So what do you see maybe happening at the, you know, ways for, to kind of to lower the temperature is a phrase that's often used at the, you know, at the very top, maybe in the next two, three years, looking down the road? I think that's gonna be very dramatic. I, I think, forget the next two, three years, the next two, three months just watching Joe Biden trying to lower the temperature on a daily basis. You know, just the other day when he came out and they're talking about the uh, president's refusal to, to concede and not uh, begin the transition process. I mean, I'd be pretty ticked off about that. And Biden is like, I'm, I'm patient, I'm willing to do it. The contrast between these two guys is gonna be, will be remarkable. The question is whether we've done so much damage. And that's what we don't, we don't know. Donald Trump, um, I think, has given permission. I think Annalise was getting at this before. She's given, he's given permission to some of the darker impulses and the worst ways of interacting to people. And you see this modeled behavior uh, just throughout our political society. You know, it is, it is extraordinary to me how powerful a negative role model he has be been. And I think that Biden seems to really think he's taken this seriously. I, he really you know, has talked about the soul of the nation, the, the need to stop demonizing one another. And so I, I think that will be as important, I may have a different perspective on this, as important a contribution as his policy decisions. I mean, presidents are going to be evaluated in a lot of different ways, but just lowering the temperature and modeling, you know, it, it, it's still kind of startling to, to, to hear a president come out and not engage in juvenile insults to make arguments, to deal with opposition with a certain amount of respect. Um, this is gonna take a while for us to realize that, that maybe the Trump era was not like the new normal, but it was a parenthesis that we're gonna kind of get back to, you know, being decent to one another again, and maybe remind us why it was important to be decent to one another, which let's face it, you know, a lot of us perhaps took for granted for a while. Or forgot. I think leadership and modeling really counts. I mean, if Trump provided, an excuse for, for poor behavior and people could say, well, that's the president. I think, as you say, Charlie, with Biden, I think he is attempting to, to model a behavior which is adult. Just today he announced, I was kind of surprised. He said he is going, before he announces any cabinet positions, he's going to have a conversation with uh, Mitch McConnell. Now McConnell hasn't even recognized him as president-elect, but he's taking the high road. Now it may not work, but he's modeling for people what we all have to try, not only at the national level, but in our families and in our neighborhoods, reaching out and at least trying. Yes. I think the, the other piece about this is, you know, that we might have a, a change in the individual at the top and we have Biden who is, you know, taking this 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 measured and um, sort of even killed approach to um, you know to what what the future looks like. You know, particularly to, as as you said, Brian, with you know folks who haven't even recognized him uh, as the winner of the election. Um, I think at some point, if the switch doesn't 
flip for the folks who are under Trump um, for, you know, the, the, the leaders of the, the, the Republican leaders in the Senate and the um, Republican leaders in the House, the Republican leaders in the other part, you know, other, other parts of, you know, the, the infrastructure, if they don't flip and also get back to this point of decency and seeing the other person as a human being and, and this, 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 um, you know, and engage in, in respect, if that doesn't happen, then, then we're looking at a dramatic couple of years and not just a dramatic couple of months. Um, you know, had, I think, you know, Trump conceded um, and, you know, and, and he might still have time, you know, to do this, but, it, you know, had he conceded right away, I think this process starts a lot sooner. Um, but we, it's going to be hard to, you know, follow Biden's lead with the, you know, with, with the issue of respect um, and decency, if that isn't the same playing field that, you know, the other folks are on. Uh, that's true. And, and, you know, it's not just up to the politicians, though. I mean, this, this is, you know, on, on the right, let's be honest about it. Um, a lot of the, the Republicans are reflecting what their base, what their voters want. We have a voter problem as well as a leadership problem in this country. And there are a lot of people who have internalized the idea that being decent and compromising with one another is a sign of weakness. That, in fact, the insults um, are, are not glitches. They are the signs of strength, and he fights, and they want that. And anyone who does not fight in, in engaging in juvenile insults somehow is letting you down, as being disloyal. And there's going to be tremendous pressure, I think, um, from the base, particularly on the right. Maybe if, if there's not a flip uh, on, on the left as well, why be nice to these people? You know, Politics should be just about power. Who has the cudgel in their hands at any given moment? And if you have the cudgel, you must use it on your opponent because that's the way it works. That's, that is an alternative future as well, is that, that you know, if, if the extended hand is rejected, then people go, okay, well, we tried that. We tried decency. Um, let, let, let's go at it. And we're, and we're very close to that. I mean, the fact that you have people who are pressuring legislators to, you know, render the election null and void and replace the electors, I mean, this is like inching closer to, we don't really want democracy anymore. We want civil war, we want authoritarianism, and you mm -hmm. hope that the calmer voices will push back on that. But a lot of that, unfortunately, is grassroots. It's coming from the bottom up, and Trump has encouraged it, he's stoked it, he's given oxygen to it, and even when he leaves, though, that's, that's going to be there. So Annalise's point is... is well, is, is uh, correct. Yeah, and I mean, it absolutely will still be there because it, it was be there, there before Trump, and you know, it was in in part how you know how we how Trump was elected. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was just was this this build up. Maybe we could take some questions from the attendees. They've been putting some interesting questions in the uh, Q and A. Um, uh, this comes from Karen in Green Lake. How do we address the mistrust and spin it, spin um, turned into facts that just aren't true? In other words, how do you get people to recognize that the Democrats aren't all Stalinist socialists and that the Republicans hate the poor? Uh, how do you get beyond that kind of mindset to get people, uh, Charlie, you were talking before about when people sit down and have conversations they, uh, if they're civil, they'll find they do share more values than uh, and we do as Americans, but we just have to cultivate those values. How do we do that? What kind of suggestions at our local levels of our daily lives can the three of you offer that might be constructive to do this? Well, I know they asked for a constructive answer, and I and I, and I wish I could be more upbeat about all of this. But I'm but I'm working on an article right now that basically will talk about this alternative reality disinformation world that we live in, and say that okay, I wrote about this back in 2016, and everything bad has gotten worse 
And I think it's going to get worse in terms of these alternative realities. And a lot of this is, is based on all an incentive structure that encourages people to demonize the other, to uh, stoke anger and to stoke grievance. I mean, that there is a marketplace for keeping people angry. And whatever, however bad it was four years ago, five years ago, it's gotten exponentially worse and it, it's about to get even, even worse. Um, I was talking to somebody today and I said, you know, I was listening into somebody sitting in for the Rush Limbaugh show. And I'm guessing there are not a lot of fans of Rush Limbaugh here and I'm not a fan, but the kind of weird conspiracy theory disinformation that I heard is the kind of thing that you would have heard from Alex Jones or some conspiracy website a few years ago. Everything has moved. It's gotten worse. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I mean, we're asking for constructive suggestions. I think, you know, part of it is, is to recognize that that is a result of this election, it doesn't just get better. And it's going to require huge efforts. And I see this election as, 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 you know, as, as, as kind of a warning sign in some ways, that when given a choice between, look, I don't agree with Joe Biden on anything, but this is a fundamentally decent, honorable, empathetic human being. And if you can't, if, you can, if a country can't look at, at him, you know, in, in, in comparison with Donald Trump and say, this is a pretty easy choice, um, that shows how deep these divisions are. So I'm, I'm going to let Molly and Annalise give you the constructive <laughs> suggestions. I just want to kind of wave the, the yeah. alarm that, that however bad you think it is, it's about to get worse. Well, I wanted to ask Molly, in fact, uh, Molly, is there hope uh, that uh, constructive uh, journalism can compete with the rage industry? I hope so. Um, <laughs> I, I, I know that after the election was called we did a lot of fact checking at at a pace and at a scope that we haven't done at least in my journalism career um which is about 15 years now um I, and so i think that the journalism industry and newspapers especially are, are just gonna have to do a lot of stories that explain how things work explain um, you're hearing this and this is the facts, you know, you're going to hear this, here's what you need to know about that. You know, it's some stories that maybe we wouldn't have written before because there is a kind of a, a, a low level of assumption of, you know, what people know and what people don't know. But, um, you know, I, I think we just, we need to, we are, we have a whole team of people that just root out um, claims that are circulating on social media and we take those and we fact check those. And, and I think that's, I hope that's been helpful in trying to figure out what's real and what's not real and, and how things work and, and whether what you're hearing is true or it's not true. Um, and even just providing context, you know, all of those things like kind of goes back to, I feel like I keep saying the same thing, but it's just, I think the more information people have that is, that is reliable and factual, the better, and I think that just will make everything better. So I, I hope that those efforts that we're, we're, we're making um, will help people understand, you know, what they're reading on social media, because that, that, is, that is hard for anybody to navigate. You know, that's, that's not, you know, a problem with the person consuming it. It's just like, there's so much of it, you know, and, and hopefully we can be a source um, to help them understand what they're reading. And I think, you know, going, you know, off of that, Molly, the, you know, this isn't just, um, you know, this isn't just, you know, the, the, the theories and the, and the thoughts from, you know, from the right that exists on the left too. And I, you know, one of the frustrating things about being in, uh, in Dane County, um, in, in our <laughs> huge host of, uh, you know, democratic votes and, you know, it's, you know, the, so liberal, but, um, it, it, it can be hard to, you know, bring conversation to reality on both the right and the left side, um, and work within, you know, what are the the the, the real true facts here, um, you know, on on a local level, but also, you know, looking at at the state and as far as you know how we consume news. I think the um, constructive part of um, you know, my answer to this and and going back to the, you know, original thought here is, um, you know, we're going to have to see that, we're going to have to see some some movement on, 
you know, from our folks at the top, but we're also going to have to step out of our own comfort zones. Um, I love sidewalks. Um, I know not everybody does, and I know that can be a really big political issue for folks, but one of the reasons I love sidewalks is that I can walk out in front of my house, I can walk my sidewalk and run into my neighbors and have conversations with my neighbors who, you know, I know that I'm going to agree with one of the paths on my street, but I'm not going to agree with the other path on my street, but we can certainly talk about her flowers. Um, and finding those commonalities and those, you know, getting out of our, our comfort zone um, to engage with someone that, you know, we, we know we might not, you know, agree with, you know, them. It's, I'm a huge dog person. I will compliment your dog, uh, even if, you know, you're, you know, you look like you might not agree with me. I'm going to want to say hi to your dog. Um, you know, that, that kind of, you know, thing, being willing to do that as an individual. Um, and that is going to be part of how we get past this. And that is going to how, like, we constructively, you know, you know, come through this. But again, it can't just be at the, at the top and it can't just be at the bottom. It has to be all of us, you know, doing this. And I don't know that we, unfortunately, as Charlie said, it's getting worse. I don't know that we're there. And that makes me really sad. Um, as a retired professor of religion, uh, I follow this stuff pretty closely. And you all are aware that during the civil rights movement, during the anti-Vietnam War, religious leaders across denominations in this country stepped forward, you know, not only with remarks and speeches, but they marched. And to me, as a former professor of religion, their, their silence now is deafening. And if Charlie is right, that things are going to get worse, and they really aren't just worse because of a disagreement of ideas, but a deep uh, emotional, uh, vitriolic feeling of our worst angels, do you see any hope for moral religious leaders particularly using their local communities. I mean, 30 to 40% of Americans say they go to houses of worship on the weekend. Now, obviously many are lying, but that's a pretty significant uh, number. Uh, after the last uh, presidential election, there were churches around the country that had um, meditation services um, um, and a small group discussion, particularly and uh, mixed people who were on a, on a progressive or conservative, and out of that came some understanding. Now, it didn't continue, but do you see any hope for uh, religious communities in this country, we're more religious than many other advanced industrial nations, to provide this kind of meeting place for face-to-face -face respectful discussion uh, and, and nurturing of deeper values besides political ideology? Yes, I mean obviously, and you know, you you made a reference to uh, De Tocqueville before, and all the these mediating institutions in society and the little platoons, and obviously, churches were fundamental, uh, understanding the role that they play. I have to say, though, that I still have the hangover from the last four years of the role of conservative white evangelical churches in all of this and what they have done, um, the damage that they have done to their brand. Um, and, and I know that there are a lot, um, I know that there are a lot of other evangel, I'm not, I'm, I'm Catholic, I'm not evangelical, so I'm not trying to you know, insult any particular group here, but I, I do know that there are a lot of others who are deeply troubled about all of this, who, uh, who are really concerned about the way that, that religion was co-opted for partisan purposes, who, who don't think that the Jerry Falwells, um, and the Franklin Grahams speak for all of them. I, this isn't my world, but I kind of had the same impression you did, uh, Professor, that they seem less vocal. Um, they, they have allowed other people to become the face of the church. Um, and I think as a result, people go, okay, what does it actually mean to be a Christian? Is Christian, Christianity about one thing? Is it about one issue? Do we have to look the way over all of these other questions? So I think that there's going to be a tremendous there ought to be a tremendous sort of period of introspection of the church um, and obviously the Catholic church as, as well and the role of religion in this particular period. And they think they have to come to grips with it. And I think a lot of religious leaders have been just intimidated by a lot of what's gone on. I, I've talked to a lot of pastors 
who actually wanted to be a much more outspoken about the children at the border, kids in cages, and who really would, would go to their, 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 their congregants and say, you are the most decent people in the world. If you saw a child walking down the middle of the street without their parents, you would be horrified. You would drop everything to make sure that that child was not separated. How then in politics have you turned around and become indifferent to the, the, the mass separation of children? How do you reconcile that? And unfortunately, they said that they got tremendous blowback because everything had become so politicized. So this is a great question, and I don't have the answers for it, but that, that, that paradox blows me away because you go into any town in Wisconsin and you ask about you know, people caring about children and about families and, and what the hell they would react to seeing you know, a child ripped from their mother's arms, and uh, you know, they would be horrified by it, and yet somehow in politics, they're willing to support it. And that's, that's one of the things that we have to like work through. I think that goes back to the personal too, is, you know, we, these, these institutions and, you know, for lack of speaking out, um, you know, with pastors who are afraid to, to say these things, um, you know, they what, lose, lose their job in the church because there's, you know, this, this uprising because there's, you know, folks who, who disagree with them. I, I've seen that, you know, in, in my own life and my own religious experience. And, but, you know, it, it's also that, again, self-introspection and, you know, sort of that, that mentality that um, of, of going against the grain um, that, that is so difficult. And uh, I think the interesting thing about, you know, religion and, and the church is part of, um, uh, you know, in, an institution uh, that will be potentially influential in, in these conversations and these pieces is um, how uh, younger folks are engaging in in religion. Um, you know, I'm a an a unabashed millennial, um, but you know, knowing that you know folks in my generation are you know less likely to be you know in attendance regularly at a you know at, at a, a religious service in a building um and you know the the folks you know even younger and so what is that doing and how does that you know we we don't go to church every sunday you know like i'm not going to synagogue every friday it's um it, it's less there's there's less folks participating and so is that going to be as big of an uh, an indicator or, or opportunity to sort of get past some of these things and to, and to work through that. And I don't know. What's interesting a, is that a better... the, the millennials who, uh, who don't go to church anymore say one reason is that the churches don't speak to important moral issues, you know, like the environment and uh, children at the border. Um, and if they, if, so if pastors wouldn't, a step out uh, of their comfort zone and do more that they might be surprised at the number of people that would take them seriously, particularly the younger generation. And it, it, it does puzzle me that when people say, I have a bracelet, what would Jesus do? Well, Jesus got killed for his moral <laughs> critique of the corruption in his society. So if you're a Christian, lay person or pastor, shouldn't you be a little, if you're gonna walk the path of Jesus, you've gotta take some risks. Well, what about yeah. that saying, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians? Yeah. Gandhi said no. that he would become a Christian overnight if there just were more Christians in the world. Our, our time is kind of running away here. I want to just mention somebody here uh, at the bottom just said religion has uh, to not push people to be one issue voters, uh, you know, just such as abortion and only focus on sort of one one or two issues. Um, maybe because, you know, Charlie, earlier you said, forget the next two or three years, look at the next two or three months. Maybe as a final question, I don't want to leave here and look at the coronavirus. Uh, and somebody just asked at the very end here, how do we depoliticize the COVID-19? Uh, COVID is there a way, you know, now that Trump, let's be honest, is not really <laughs> doing really anything at this very moment, uh, what do you, do you see sort of a path forward just for the next few months uh, and how to, come more together on this issue? Um, I, 
I've been doing a lot of reporting on this issue in Wisconsin, and in the last couple of days, um, pretty much every you know health leader has said that there needs to be a unified public message on this issue. Um, and they're not seeing that, at least in Wisconsin. And um, from their view, they think that would go a long way. You know, if if the leaders of uh, both parties got together on the same on the same page on a on a message, not necessarily on policy, but just on a message, um, they said that that would that would help a lot. So I think you know, especially in Wisconsin, there's you know the the pol the issue of what policy should be in place is under debate but that public message is what they're looking for well this is going to be yeah, the big absolutely. test of this will this will be the big test of the of the biden administration when it comes in they, they need to get this right unfortunately though uh, if you would have asked me a year ago would would wearing masks become a cultural flashpoint no but I mean, we've seen everything becomes politicized. Everything becomes political, and um, you would think that this, the, the death of a quarter million Americans, would be a reality check, and it hasn't been uh, for for a lot of Americans. And I'm afraid um, that what you're going to see next next spring is more tribalization around this particular issue. Um, that there will be more protests. Um, that we will continue to be divided. But. I mean, Molly is obviously right. You know, the health leaders in this country are pleading, can we at least be responsible? Can we at least not engage in reckless rhetoric? So um, on, on a more positive note, I think the message coming from a White House that takes the science seriously, that understands the need to actually bring an end to this, that it's not the economy versus health. It's that we won't bring the economy back until we get a handle on the coronavirus will be a positive thing. So, and then of course we just pray that the vaccine comes online and that the taking of the vaccine does not become a politically tribalized issue as well. Because here's the, here's the problem. If we can't come together um, around a mass pandemic, what will bring us together? I mean, if we were having this in the abstract, we would say, what would it take to unite Americans? Well, some national disaster on the level of 9-11. Well, what if we had, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 times as many people uh, who die, well, would, would that be enough? We would say, okay, well, that would be enough to bring us together. And we're living through it right now. So this is, this is, this is a stress test for the country and our ability to come together. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, you know, I think, you know, for, for Biden, I think the first thing is, you know, and, and on a national level, um, you know, prioritizing the response to COVID so that we can actually have the economic response that we need. Um, you know, I, we, I, I see it in Dane County. Um, you know, I would love if the state was able to follow Dane County's lead in how we've dealt with the, you know, with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic. But, um, you know, I think there's, there's one party that is politicizing it and the other party isn't. And um, that, you know, I think started with Trump's initial response when COVID came to the U.S. And so I, I, I'm i grateful that, um, you know, Biden uh, believes in the science um, and that, you know, we, I know that there are um, Republicans in power in both Wisconsin and in the, you know, in the federal government that do believe um, in in the science of, of COVID and uh, the the response that the the, the experts have. Um, it's just whether or not those voices are going to be able to rise above the, um, you know, the folks that are going to continue to insist on, you know, on, on making this a political issue. And, you know, unfortunately, um, it, COVID, it, with our community spread where it is now, not just in Wisconsin, but the entire country, I mean, it does not care what political party it, you're from. It doesn't care who you voted for. And um, if if this isn't something that folks can come together on, on quickly and, and take the politics out of it, you know, we're not going to be in a place where we can recover economically. And that's going to have even, you know, more dire consequences for us, you know, as a as an economic world power, but also I think you know from a national security standpoint, um, and our continued um, you know position in the world um, as as a country that you know folks you know can and and be can and should be looking to. 
um, for as a leader. Um, I know our, you know, I, I, I want to be respectful of, 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 of your time, of our in atten uh, attendees time. We said 75 minutes or so. We went a little bit over. I think Brian is okay if we can wrap, wrap it up here, right? I think so. Uh, we want to really thank you panelists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you also for the attendees for joining us. Thank you for your questions. There were so many good comments in the, in the, in the chat. One thing we can promise, we will do this more in the future. So we will just maybe specialize more on specific themes. Then again, this was just sort of the post-election process. Um, I also want to thank uh, Amy Gerritsen, the director of the Office of Constituent Engagement uh, of Ripon College, and Alyssa uh, Retza, the director of uh, Web uh, um, and, uh, and marketing, they have been really outstanding in helping us prepare for these webinars and, uh, and they will help us also in the future. We will do more webinars uh, in the spring semester. This is the last one for this, uh, this semester. We will inform you uh, via you know, our media releases as well as uh, our email lists. And so hopefully you can join us again and we can have more of these kinds of conversations. Thanks so much for all of your valuable uh, thoughts and uh, and feedback and we will re we have recorded this so you can also uh, look at the recording on YouTube we will share it uh, with you thank you all right thanks uh, thanks everybody have a good night hey, good night, good night. Hey guys thank you. thank you Charlie you don't have to drive home in the dark I don't <laughs> <laughs> thank you all thank you Annalise and Molly appreciate it very much yeah. Have a good day. Yeah, I think it was you. a wonderful thank conversation. You. Thank you. A lot of positive comments in the Q and A. So thank you so much. Yep. It's a great event. Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll do it again. <laughs>